Good morning. Come on in. Come on in. I uh, just want to remind folks a little bit about the schedule of the, this, we consider this Holy Week. Um, it is uh, the high point of the church calendar because we get to celebrate something that changes our lives. We get to celebrate the resurrection. We get to celebrate Christ's sacrifice and the fact that the grave could not keep him down. That's coming. That's next week. Today we acclaim Jesus. Uh, we, we praise him. Uh, and we reflect a little bit about where Jesus is headed. You'll get some more of that. But we want to kind of keep in mind what is happening this week. Um, for those of you who came this last Wednesday to play Bunko and enjoy the fellowship, we apologize for the fact that that, was, that didn't happen. Um, the appendix waits for no person. And so our, our leader on that was, uh, was incapacitated, and we're glad that Amber's feeling better. Um, but we will have that coming up this Wednesday, so if you are interested in, in a redo on that, the fifth will be a family game night and a fellowship meal here at the church at our regular time, so we invite you to, to do that. That's just what we normally do. That's part of the regular schedule. Following that, on Thursday evening, we're having our love feast, and you are obviously all invited to that. I'd love to have folks come out. If, again, it's something that you're not familiar with and would like to just learn more, the best way to do is observing. And so come on and, and, and watch and share in that. Um, it'll be a blessed time. I'll, I will guarantee it. If you're open for it, the blessing will be there. And so uh, that's at 6 o'clock on Thursday, Monday, Thursday. The next thing that we'll have is at 7 o'clock Easter morning. We're going to have our sunrise service out at Walters Ferry. We invite you to come out to that if you're interested. Um, it is a, it is a good. Um, I don't know. They've had some changes out there. The, the landscape has been readjusted a bit. And so we're, I'm curious to find out what, uh, what changes have been made. One of the big old Russian olive trees fell this year. Um, and so they had to take that out and, and do some regrading and some, some cleanup out there. But uh, it'll be new, just like resurrection. So we're going to go and celebrate that 7 o'clock uh, Easter morning. We'll have the regular uh, 945 Sunday school time here at the church after that, and then 11 o'clock for our regular service on Sunday. So that lets you know the schedule. That should be also printed on in the newsletter and on the website if you have questions um, or call the office. So those will be things. I know this gets a little bit crazy, logistically speaking, about this time of year. We don't know what's going to happen next, but that's the, that's the lowdown on that. We are here to celebrate Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so I'm going to get out of the way and let the youth and the young people take over. I, I'm assuming the kids are out there. Okay. to give some music for our young our young palm wavers to come in by so they can and I'd like for you to just stay seated while we sing so everybody can see our our cute little ones as they come in so we're going to sing Hosanna Hosanna so Hosanna to the king done singing.
Rosanna. Rosanna. West is he who comes. In the name of the Lord. It was the beginning of Passover week when Jews from all over traveled to Jerusalem to remember their freedom from slavery and oppression. You see, the Jews had once been ruled by Egypt and never wanted to struggle again in that way. While traveling with his disciples, Jesus looked toward a town below and knew this was the perfect time and place to show the Roman Empire what he and his followers were truly about. As they walked toward the town, Jesus looked at two of his disciples and told them to told them to get and go get him a colt tied up in the village, which no one had ever ridden. When the disciples brought the colt back to him, they threw their cloaks on it, and Jesus Swing got on. As he went along, more people spread their cloaks on the road for the colt to walk on. And when he came near, the whole crowd with him began joyfully praising God for all the miracles they had seen. They all waved their hands and palms and shouted, Hosanna. That same day, Pilate, the royal official who had ruled over Jerusalem, would be arriving to hold a parade of his own to show the empire's power. Because of this, some of the Pharisees in the crowd got scared of the Roman government would find out about this and arrest them all, or worse. They tried to quiet the crowd and told Jesus, Teacher, tell your disciples to stop their cheering. Jesus shrugged at the Pharisees. I tell you, he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones would cry out. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and looked down upon the city, he felt deep sadness. He said, I wish you had known what would bring you true peace. Instead, your enemies will soon trap you. With a heavy heart, Jesus continued with the parade of his followers into the city. They cheered, so grateful their Savior had come to give them life and freedom. Good morning. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to our church this morning. I hope you are visiting, you feel at home here today, and I think it's a wonderful day that we're here to celebrate Palm Sunday. And with that, I'm going to read a, a Hosanna, Hosanna, a Palm Sunday poem by Debbie Schofield. It was morning. It was a morning so bright and clear, the disciples and Jesus were standing quite near. In Jerusalem, it was really Passover day, it was nearly Passover day, and soon they would be all be heading that way. Jesus said to them, go find a colt, a donkey that is, one that won't bolt. Bring the beast back for Jesus to ride, who would hold the reins, they couldn't decide. They found the animal just as he said, and all ready to go, having just been fed. But never, but never ridden before, you see, what a special first ride that turned out to be. They threw coats and on the donkey to create a seat, helped Jesus on, and knelt at his feet. As they led him down the rocky road, a crowd began to gather to see the colt's load. Once they saw who it was, their shouts did outring, Hosanna, Hosanna, it's Jesus the King. Waving palm branches and shouting his name, it seemed like Jesus was destined for fame. It's funny to think, though, it was only a week when the tables had turned and the disciples would see to all hide away at Jesus was, as Jesus was dead. Nailed to a cross, a crown of thorn on his head. 
Then three days later, the world would wake and news of amazing for all of our sake that Jesus so weakened and then killed by the mod. Yes, dead but not, but now released, O oh, glory to God. And this morning's scripture is uh, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to the Beth to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to disciples, saying, "Go, saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and He will send them right away." This took place to fulfill what the spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Would you uh, join me in a word of prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time to come together and worship with you. We just ask, Lord, you will keep it in our minds and our hearts what this special time of the year is for us as Christians, Lord. We just ask now you be with each one of us, be with Pastor John as he brings us your word this morning. We ask this in thy precious name, dear Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing at Calvary. It's in your red hymnal if you need it on page 400. We're going to sing the first, third, and fourth. In other words, no two. This is a great one for harmony. So those of you that sing alto and tenor, this is your chance. verses up there. Let's go ahead and sing the second verse. <laughs> okay, here we go.
The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Say it. The Lord is The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. Nancy! Do that. Good morning again. I'm going to be reading from uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. Remember this. Whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, it will abound in every good work, as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. It's just a reminder that no matter what, you know, what our situation is, God wants us to give, not just of our abundancy, but from our heart. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to give back to you a small portion of what you have blessed us with. We just ask that you give this money, this offering, Lord, for further your kingdom here in Nampa and throughout the world. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite the kids forward. feel kind of uncomfortable with you right behind me. You're going to knock me over? <laughs> he would. So. Hi. How are y'all doing? What are you two up? Don't, don't know. That's a sister thing there. Come on. Sit up. All right. So what's going on today? What's, what's special about this Sunday? It's Palm Sunday. Yeah, you guys came in, you waved palm branches, and we told the story several times. The youth told the story, you heard what they read, they told a little bit about it, and then Leroy read a poem about it, and then he read a scripture out of Matthew that told the story from the Bible. <laughs> there you go. So, here's a question that I've got for you. What do you think about that donkey? What was that all about? Do you have an idea? What do you think? 
So Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, into the city, on a really young donkey. One that hadn't even been ridden before. So what do you think that was about? Any ideas? That just seems like that's part of the story, doesn't it? We just like going, I don't know what that was about. That was just something that happened, right? What do you think, though? What would it say if Jesus came into town on a donkey? What do you think it would tell us about Jesus? Yeah, okay, I got some pictures, all right? So look at this one. What's that? Oh, yeah, it's the queen's carriage. Actually, the king's carriage now. This is the one that King Charles would ride in. This is the official carriage of the British royal family. It's not made up. This is the real deal. You want to pass that one around? Because the queen of England died. Yeah, she did. Exactly. So this is now what they would, and they would, they would get in there. Pretty fancy, huh? You can, you can pass it around. You guys want to look closely at it? Go ahead. Now, that's pretty fancy, right? Do we have a carriage like that in America? What do we use? We use that. Oh, a car. That's right. Yeah. We, we, don't, uh, we don't use carriages. We use cars in America. So this is the presidential limo. That's right. We have a president. We don't have a king or a queen. We have a president. But he rides around in a pretty fancy car, huh? It's shiny. It's black. It's fancy. It's got flags on the fenders. It's pretty awesome, huh? You know what the president flies in? A helicopter. Well, sometimes, but whenever he goes across the country, he flies in this giant airplane. It's huge. That's a Boeing, I think it's a 747, but it's enormous, isn't it? Yeah, and it's got special color. It says United States of America. It's just just really super fancy, isn't it? So important people fly around in, in fancy planes and drive around in shiny cars and ride in fancy carriages, right? Important people. So what do you think Jesus would come in if he came today? If it was like today, if the the stuff of Palm Sunday was happening today? I think it probably would be like that. What is this? It's a rusty old pickup. A pickup? Yeah. What? Yeah? You think Jesus would come in on a rusty old pickup like that? Why? Why? Yeah, they didn't have, yeah, you're right. <laughs> they didn't have cars back then. But if he came today, do you think he might show up in a rusty pickup? No. You don't think so? What do you think he'd show up in? A fancy car? A shiny limousine? No? Well, I'm going to tell you what the donkey means. The donkey means that Jesus came humbly. You guys know what humble means? It means not thinking too much of yourself, not thinking too like too proud or too vain, but humbly. Now, here's the question for you guys and for us. Is it important to be humble? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Can I get agreement from everybody on that? Eh, Is it easy to be humble? No. 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 Sometimes we want fancy things like carriages and limousines, but Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to show you what it's like to be like me. And that's being humble. That's what the donkey means. And it's an important part of the story. So can you guys remember that? That Jesus came humbly on a donkey. And we can be humble too. Even if it takes a little bit of effort on our part, right? All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you came to Jerusalem on a donkey to remind us how important it is to be humble. To not think too much of ourselves. To not pump ourselves up or be too prideful. Lord, we pray that you would help us be that, humble and gentle, like you were. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go. And you guys can go. Let's stand and sing, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. If you like to use the hymnal, we're going to sing the old rugged cross when we finish this song. And so I'm not going to pause and give you time to search in the hymnal. 
So you better get it out now if you're wanting it. The Red Hymnal, page 317.
side. Blessing to have so many people participating in the service today, both y'all singing and the kids sharing, and it's just it's just a wonderful thing, and I'm just blessed by it, and I thank you all. We've got two scriptures today, You're probably familiar with both of them. The first comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. In the first chapter, beginning in the 15th verse, Paul writes, and it's about Jesus, in case you were wondering. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And then back one letter to the Philippians letter, the one that Paul writes to the church there in Philippi, and this is from the second chapter. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You've heard it a few times already, but this story, the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, it's a complicated story. On the one hand, you've got all of the praise, all of the adoration, all of the, the, the glory that the, the crowd shower upon Jesus. But on the other hand, we know where this account is in the bigger gospel story. We know that there were hosannas, that there were praises, but we also know that Jesus was headed to the cross. And so maybe it's a little hard to know just how we are supposed to respond here. Like we shared, it was with a heavy heart that Jesus entered Jerusalem because he knew. He knew what was in front of him. Part of us wants to focus on the, the praise, the acclaim, the hosannas. It's why we do this, why we raise the palm branches and wave them on on Sunday morning, but there in the back of our minds, uh, we know that in spite of it all, in spite of the hosannas, the crowd, they didn't know who they were praising. They didn't really recognize him. They didn't know what Jesus was all about at that moment. They were, in a lot of ways, they were praising a different Messiah than the one that was riding there in front of them on the back of that young donkey. Now, Paul gets this. In his first letter to the Corinthians, he says that the gospel is a confusing thing. It's a a confusing message to those that aren't receptive to it. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul says that the cross is a stumbling block for the Jews. It's, It's foolish to the Gentiles. Basically, he says, people don't get it. They don't understand You see, for the Jews, they knew that for someone to die on a tree, to die on a cross, that was to be cursed. By definition, there could be no redeeming quality to that sort of death. Now, for the Gentiles, who were so wrapped up in those worldly markers of success and acclaim, things that perhaps we are tempted by even today, the power, the the wealth, if you died a criminal's death, 
Well, that's ridiculous. That was that 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 right there. It proved that that you were nobody. For both Jews and Gentiles, the death of Jesus, the horror of it, the shame of it, it was proof of the illegitimacy of what Jesus represented. How? How could he bring any kind of message that we would listen to? Just like back in the Old Testament, they they thought that the gods revealed their power in the success and the power of the one that worshipped them. The conqueror, they had strong gods. The conquered, well, they... They, those gods were weak and ineffectual. Death, particularly a shameful death on a cross, that, that proved that the message of Jesus was false, at least as far as the world was concerned. So what do we do with this story? What do we do with the, the triumph of Palm Sunday when it's followed so closely by Good Friday? You see, there's a basic, a fundamental conflict here between two opposing perspectives. You see, either the world is right, and the cross is a stumbling block, it is foolishness, or Jesus is right. Jesus is right, and the cross is the ultimate triumph for those who are being saved by the power of God. It's either one or the other. There's no middle ground here. You've got to have... One choice or that choice. And, and for believers, we've made the right choice, right? We've made the right choice. We, we believe that Jesus is right. But maybe we're still struggling with the implication of that choice. I mean, it certainly comes along with some, some implications. Maybe there's a reason that Paul didn't say that the cross is the power of God to those who are saved, but to those who are being saved. We're still getting a handle on this. Because what the cross represents, it's hard to accept. It carries that sense of foolishness that made it so unattractive in the first place. It's still there. It is a rugged cross. It's an emblem of suffering and shame. Now, we're much more comfortable with the triumphant part, right? <laughs> with, the, with the hosannas of Palm Sunday than we are with suffering and loss. But what Jesus does, it goes further than our shallow understandings of our human thinking. You see, he understood that you don't get triumph without loss. You don't get resurrection without crucifixion. We don't get to jump from Palm Sunday to Easter without going through Good Friday. Now, we looked at two passages today. Two passages that aren't, they're not really connected in the way that we're used to either to each other or to this story of Palm Sunday. The first we mentioned comes from Paul's letter to the, the Colossians. And in that first chapter, Paul's letting the church know, in no uncertain terms, just who Jesus really is. There's no dancing around the issue here. Paul gets right to the heart of it. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus represents in human flesh what God is in spirit. Now that's incarnational language. It's hard for us sometimes to think, get our head around that. But we see it at the beginning of John's gospel, that language that he uses about the word becoming flesh and making its, his dwelling with us. Paul goes on, he says that Jesus is the creational driving force behind all things. He says, in him all things were created, both visible and invisible. He was there before the beginning. He was pre-existent and before all things. And, and in Jesus, everything holds together. Okay, this one gets me every time I think about it. This is amazing stuff. I invite you to think about it too. Did you know that every material thing that we interact with, every physical thing that we encounter, in everything there is more space than matter? I want you to think about that for a second. Okay, those little nuclei, those little atoms, and the elements that everything's made up of with the little tiny core, with the little electrons, and it's much smaller than I'm illustrating here. The little electrons spinning around it that are even tinier. These tiny, tiny little things, these, these atoms woven together in a matrix with other elements. They make up everything that we observe. Everything that we touch, that we see, we smell. Everything that we sense. 
But what feels solid to us is actually those electromagnetic forces that knit those tiny bits of matter to each other. <laughs> what is, what we experience in the physical world, it's all held together by Jesus. This is both a, a spiritual reality and a physical reality. Have you ever thought that maybe God just wound everything up and set it spinning and then walked away and said it's good on its own? If you ever thought that, this verse should challenge that. This verse should challenge that thinking. We exist wholly and completely as a manifestation of God's will. God wants us to be whole and complete and together a physical entity. God wants us to exist, and because God wants it, we do. What a miracle that is. In Jesus, all things hold together. Maybe I didn't explain it very well. Are you amazed by that? Be amazed. It is amazing. You get the idea, though, right? You read this passage in Colossians, Jesus is awesome amazing, glorious. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. This is the Jesus we want to see on Palm Sunday, right? This is the one that we want to wave our branches and, and sing hallelujah and hosanna about, right? And all, of the, and all that praise and all of that wonder of who Jesus is, we might, because we're human and we don't like negative things, we might actually lose sight of some important stuff we might lose sight of the cross and that's where the philippians passage comes in in philippians paul says to the church he says to the church there that we need to have the same mind as christ jesus that's how he starts the passage the the, the text that we read today and i, and I need you to make note of that <laughs> grab a hold of that hold on to it we're coming back to it have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Paul then goes on and he describes what that mind of Christ Jesus looks like. First, he affirm, affirms everything that he said in Colossians. Everything that, that he said in Colossians, he repeats here, different words, but it's the same kind of idea. Jesus is all of that, all of what we've said, the image of the invisible God in whom all of the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Jesus is awesome. Okay, He says it again. In Philippians, he uses the phrase that Jesus existed in the form of God, equal to God. It was no big deal for Jesus to reach out and hold on to that. He could do that. It was in his reach. He could have grabbed it and held it if he wanted. So we start in the same place that we did with the Colossians passage. This understanding that Jesus, it matches. And it's what we want to see when we talk about the triumphal entry, right? Jesus entering into Jerusalem the image of the invisible God, Lord of creation, in whom all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, the one in whom everything holds together. That's who we see. That's who we want to see. But what comes next causes us to stumble. Now we're getting into the foolish part. Even though Jesus is all of those things that Paul describes in Colossians, even though Jesus could have rightfully held on to his equality with the Father, Jesus chooses, chooses to set that all aside, to empty himself of it, and to take on human form, the form of a slave. Okay, now you're getting the foolish part, right? <laughs> Would you give that up? Would you trade limousines and fancy coaches for a rusty old pickup truck? Depends on the pickup truck, right? Jesus chooses to set that aside. The ultimate creator chooses to take on the form of the created. He puts on flesh. Now Paul's careful to note something here. He doesn't say that Jesus put on the flesh of a king or the flesh of an emperor, the flesh of the powerful and the privileged. No, he, he says that Jesus assumes a particular human likeness, a particular human flesh. He took on the form of a slave. And then Paul says, hey, let's just go to the logical conclusion of this. Let's take it all the way to the end. If Jesus is really fully human, 
if Jesus does take on flesh and shares in all of the things that, that make both king and slave human, then Jesus goes all the way, all the way to death, oh, even death on a cross. That boggles my mind. That is a stumbling block. That is foolish. But now, because of this inconceivable scale of this sacrifice that Jesus is willing to make, not just that he was willing to die, but that he was willing to become human in the first place, the Father has exalted Jesus to the highest. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess just who Jesus really is. It is inevitable because of what Jesus was willing to do, what Jesus chooses to do. I want you to catch this sequence because it's important. We start way up here in glory. Jesus, equal with God, holding on to his godness was not a big deal because it was his to begin with. One with the Father, sharing in the essence, having the fullness of God dwelling in him, as it says in Colossians. Jesus is what we see in these two letters. It's where we start. And then we end up later at a place that looks very similar to that, right? Maybe even a little better. With the name of Jesus being exalted above every other name. With every knee bowing, every tongue praising. Glory upon glory at the beginning. Glory upon glory at the end. But there's this swing down into pain and suffering in between. And it's important to understand for us to understand that Jesus chooses this. Jesus makes the choice to dwell with us, to feel what we feel, to experience what we experience, to suffer like we suffer, to die like we die. We can't ever, ever lose sight of that or forget that. We can't forget that there is a cross between Palm Sunday and and Easter. I'm thinking we're all on board so far, right? You're on board? Yeah. This is stuff we've heard. This is stuff we've thought about. We've prayed about it. For most believers, we've had plenty of time to reflect on this truth, that there is. We mentioned it several times at the beginning of the service. There's a cross between this triumphal entry and the empty tomb. We get it, if, or if we don't fully get it, we, we, we accept it. And we praise Jesus for it. We're so grateful for this, for being willing to sacrifice himself for our sake. I am. I hope you are as well. So we've avoided the stumbling block. <laughs> Whoop, got around it. We've, we've embraced the foolishness, what the world calls foolish. And it is the power of God for us as we are being saved. Jesus, who is exactly who Paul says that he is in both Colossians and Philippians, did what Paul says he did in that second letter, in, in Philippians. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He took on our form and submitted to death, even death on a cross. And it's the pain of the passion, the pain of the cross, that makes the glory of the resurrection all the more meaningful. So for most of us, we know. We know who we're praising and why we're praising him when we wave the palm branches on Palm Sunday. But there may be another part of this that's a little harder for us to accept. It's the part that introduces the Philippians passage. See, I told you we were coming back to it, and here we are. Where Paul says that we are to have the same mind as Christ Jesus. I know, I was going to get there eventually, and you're like going, oh, yay, Jesus. Well, there's part for us to do here. There's something that we have to follow through on. Keep in mind what, what Paul's already said in this second chapter of this letter to the Philippians. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Everyone's favorite passage, right? Mm. Maybe not so much. Basically, he's saying that if you, as followers of Jesus, as believers in Jesus... If you're going to be faithful to that, well, then you need to be humble. You need to set aside selfish ambition and vain conceit. You need to think of others as better than yourselves. Why? It's very simple. 
because that's what Jesus does. I don't need to come up with a better argument than that, do I? That's what Jesus does. If you're going to have the mind of Christ Jesus, that's going to be what's in your mind. So in essence here, what Paul is calling the church to, not just the church in Philippi, not just the church in Colossae, but the church in Nampa, what Paul is calling the church to is an imitation of Christ, to be like Christ. Not so much in the glorification of Christ, but in that self-emptying sacrifice of Christ. That is the aspect of Christ's mind that we're supposed to have, the humble part. And it's tricky. I get it. You see, we're pretty sure about things sometimes. We're sure, up and down, left and right, we're sure that we're right. I mean, yeah, right? Nobody here is wrong. You're all right. I mean, this is what causes the quarrels that we get into, the arguments that we get into. I mean, and that's biblical. James says it in his fourth chapter. What causes fights and quarrels among you, he writes, Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, and so you quarrel, and you fight. I mean, that's human nature. It's pride. Pride in this conviction that what we want is the only thing that matters. I mean, I want you to think about this. In the life that you inhabit, in this world that we witness all the time, what causes disagreement what is at the heart of any quarrel when two people when two families two groups Hatfields and McCoys when two political parties when two nations two empires whenever they go at it why do they go at it well because each of them is convinced up and down left and right that they are right that their desires are what matter and what the other person or party or empire wants is wrong or flawed or corrupt. You've heard this narrative, right? You've heard these words, I'm sure. But here's the thing. What fuels that conviction of rightness in our position isn't always its rightness. Sometimes it's just a matter of pride. How many of you have argued about something, found out you were wrong later, and asked yourself, why did I argue about that? Pride. Being motivated by selfish ambition and empty conceit, the way Paul puts it. It's a conviction that's grounded on our own interests and not so much the interests of others. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing about what Jesus does here that makes it so miraculous and so wondrous and why why it's probably a challenge for us to let that Christ-like mind shape our thinking. Jesus does something that's really hard for people to do, for humans to do. Not impossible, but hard. You see, we get into fights, we get into quarrels because we think we're right. Well, Jesus actually is right. We've already established that, right? Jesus is right. You see, if there was anybody in human history who could justifiably stand their ground and push their agenda, it would be Jesus. I mean, yeah, it's Jesus, the one who was in every way the image of the invisible God, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, Jesus, equal with God, the one exalted more highly, whose name is above every name. You get who we're talking about here, right? Okay. If there is a debate about who is right, Jesus is right. Can you argue with that? I hope not. Well, you can try. It ain't going to do you any good. Jesus is right. Flat out. And so, Jesus could ride into Jerusalem and all of the hosannas and all of the praise hymns entirely appropriate. If anybody could claim any worldly throne, any empire as his own, it would be Jesus. It would be the one that created them all and holds them all together as an act of his will. But even though Jesus is totally and completely and eternally right, 
Jesus doesn't consider that position as something to hold on to, something to protect at all costs. Instead, he gives it up for us. This blows my mind. This is wild stuff. This is a stumbling block for those that don't get it. And this is the mind that we are called to have. If the one who is eternally right about everything can set aside that rightness and become like us, take on the pain-riddled, corruptible form of a slave, be willing to put it all on the line at Calvary, then those of us, and I mean all of us here, who aren't so right, (laughs) who can't claim otherwise, really, maybe... Maybe we can set aside our desires for the sake of each other. If Jesus did all that, then maybe we can do this little thing. Maybe we can not think so highly of ourselves, not grasp so tightly to whatever power that we think we deserve. Maybe we can stop chasing that worldly brass ring, the the one that promises privilege and position, gives us everything that we think we want. Instead of that covetousness and that pride, we can think a little more of others than we do ourselves. Over and over again in our own lives, we try to go from glory to glory without entering into the pain. We try to skip over the sacrifice, skip over the humility, because that means that we got to maybe give up the fact that we're right about everything. To humble ourselves, to let Christ's mind be in us, it seems like, well, then I'm just going to be letting those wrong people get away with it. That bothers us. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, but that's exactly what Jesus did. And Jesus chose it. Why would we think that we're a better judge of right and wrong and who should get what than Jesus is? Why would something that Jesus chose be something that we refuse? It's good to praise Jesus. I love it. We should do it more. Hosannas are entirely appropriate. Jesus is, after all, exalted most high with a name that is above every name. But the path that Jesus traveled to that exaltation went by way of the cross. Jesus humbled himself, emptied himself, sacrificed himself. And as followers of Jesus, that is the mind that we are to have. Which means holding a little less tightly to the glory of the world, to the patterns of this age, and holding a little more tightly to Jesus. It means being willing to set our pride aside and letting what's good for others motivate us. See, when we can have even just a little bit of that Christ-like mind, when we can think a little more like Jesus thinks, then I think we can trust that God will do the same for us that he did for Jesus. God will lift us up too. And we don't have to fight and quarrel to prove that we're right all the time. Just trust that God's going to work that stuff out. Burning away our own wrongness and leaving only gold. Just like Jesus, our path to that exaltation of the Father lifting us up, it leads by way of humility. But, you know, I'm willing to give up the world to gain my soul. We're going to share together now in communion. It's a special opportunity. There is a different order on the back of your bulletins than we've used in the past. It is Palm Sunday, so this is a Palm Sunday reading. And as is our tradition, everyone who has a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is welcome at this table. I like to think of it as Jesus inviting us, not me, not the church, but Jesus saying, come, eat, drink. This is my body that is broken for you and my blood that is shed for you. So you know that better than I do, where you are with Christ, where you are with your brothers and sisters. We also 
traditionally take time to reflect before we, we join around this table. And so I'll invite you, we'll read this first section of call and response, and then we'll enter into a time of silence. I want you to be prepared. Jesus wants you to be prepared. So get your heart ready to come to this table. So join me. Let us open the gates of our hearts that the sovereign God Lord, may come in. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. And so, dear God, we offer to you our worship through Jesus Christ, your Son, who came to us humbly and riding on a donkey's foal. In stillness, we will prepare our hearts. If you would bow with me. Lord Jesus, you know us better than we know ourselves. And in this silence, you have heard what our hearts have offered to you. We thank you for this invitation. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the eve of his death, shared a meal with his followers. Taking the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and offered it to them with these words. This is my body, broken for you. Remember me when you eat it. If you would bow with me. Lord, we ask a blessing on this bread, reminder of your body. Sacrifice for us willingly so that we might be more than who we are. We thank you for this gift. And we pray in your precious name. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you.
Let us take it together. wine he gave thanks and offered it to them with these words this is my blood poured out for you remember me when you drink if you would bow with me lord we ask a blessing on this cup the contents remind me of christ's blood remind us of that sacrifice we pray that it would have its work within us as we remember that pray in the name of christ amen the blood of Christ shed for you. Shall we take it together? And if you would join me in this final reading. And so now, Lord, we eat and drink in memory of Jesus and his great love. And in this simple meal, we proclaim his death and resurrection, giving life to all people. Let's stand and sing a song called, I Live, I Live Because He Is Risen. with me. Lord, we do live because you live. It is a life that is not only physical, but spiritual. 
And you lead us into this world as a living God. You ask us to share your love with others. You command us to love each other. And so we'll do that to the best of our ability and the strength of your spirit. Bring us into contact with those that need your love so that we might share it with them. And Lord, we pray that you would gather us again next week as we celebrate the resurrection. Celebrate what it means to be children of a living God. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.